So this is a talk about pattern libraries, but they're also known as you know style guides or design systems and things like that. Um, if you can remember what Bootstrap 3 used to look like, like a long page full of all these widgets and stuff, we're kind of talking about something like that. Um, uh, and the idea essentially is you've got these Lego blocks that you build your page out of. You really polish each one of these little components and you sort of, then you're able to assemble these all into a particular application. But first of all, I'll just sort of introduce myself. Uh, so I used to work for Catalyst. I realized I didn't quite make the 10 year thing. I think I was here about like eight years maybe. So I might, if just, I might get a bit of Sharpie out and sort of right below that, eight years, <laughs> sign it. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see. Um, so, uh, you know, like, like most of you, I assume you were born at one point, I was too. Um, and soon after that, I started doing development for IE3, which was the, that, yeah, I'm old. And, and so that was the first browser to have CSS. Um, the, al the alternative at the time was JavaScript style sheets by Netscape 4, but no one uses that, right? And uh, soon after, I did some stuff for the e-government unit. So I was involved in the first version of the web guidelines, which it later became the web standards. And um, then I got into a little bit of like copyright law and politics and stuff like that. So organized this copyright campaign, you might remember. Probably not. Um, yeah, okay, cheers. I was someone. Um, and then, but these days I'm just, you know, happy life in Island Bay, and that's not Island Bay, that's Fiji. It's way, way nicer. <laughs> so that, that's me. Um, uh, and there's a bunch, I work at this company called Springload, that's the logo there, and um, we do a bunch of sort of open source stuff. There's some nice packages, some useful things, and we do a lot of accessible components. So as I was saying to start with, uh, Bootstrap is sort of a, you know, a common example, a common sort of, ways of way of talking about the kind of thing that we're referring to um, when we're talking about pattern libraries. But really an another way of thinking about it is that you have sort of design systems as a sort of overarching concept. Um, design systems, the idea is that they're going to encompass everything. They're going to include the language, the tone, the branding, the colors, the principles, the tools, maybe the artifacts, so as in particular turns, uh, sort of turns of phrase or anything like that, the, the, the personality of your website, like are you gonna be a friendly chatty website, are you gonna be standoffish? If you're a government agency, how are, you going, what's, how are you gonna be perceived? What's the credibility you need to establish? So design systems are all of those kinds of sort of brand considerations. Uh, style guides tend to be about the specific implementation details, so talking about who actually makes these decisions within the organization, who actually gets to say, what a button looks like or what the, what the tone of it everything is. So, so style guides are sort of all that kind of process around it. Um, and a pattern library is actually getting down to the specifics of components. So you know, how a text box looks, um, how an image is displayed, all of that kind of stuff. So um, the idea with this is that you're going to try and achieve more cohesive designs, right? Like as opposed to something where a website might have one way of an image one way of doing images on a particular section of the site and then another way on another section of the site. The idea is to use all these things and to think of them more as components. So there's a good reason why we start thinking about things in terms of components is that uh, I think that our industry, as in you know, w the web, some people do web stuff, um, is, um, is, is still actually stuck with a lot of inefficiencies. We're still in this, um, old way of doing things, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so my job, uh, I'm the front end director at Springload, and my job is to often just look at kinds of inefficiencies across the business and how we develop things and try to see that. And a lot of what um, we've been coming out of as an industry, I mean, is that we've got this thing where we still just receive things like Photoshop files, or we might receive you know, sketch files or something like this, but essentially what we receive is screenshots of pages. And so as any web developer who's come along something like this, you have all these questions, right, when you see this. Let's just say, so what that home button there, is that breadcrumbs or is that a back button? You know, how are we gonna name that thing? What is, what's the language for that? Is that there a, an H1? Does, do all H1s have a Maori translation equivalent? If they don't have one, what do you do? Is, there, is that the height of that fixed? Do we have wrapping? Does the Maori word 
start on a new line always, or is it just because that one there, there is just long enough to wrap, right? We have all of these questions. Uh, is that a paragraph, or is that some kind of intro? Is that just something to do with a calendar widget, or is that a highlight box, or what, what are we going to call these things? Uh, more of these kind of things, you know, H2s, are they? Links, maybe? So, pattern libraries are also a way of improving the communication from designers to front-end developers, so FEDs. I don't know if people use that term. Um, so, it's just a sort of a way of having naming conventions. So, you can sort of approach this from uh, like BIM or SMACs, which are, you know, popular CSS naming conventions. Um, but really what you want to do is you want to be able to negotiate with the designer and, f and figure out like a common language for this kind of stuff. So, right, okay, so when feds are receiving sort of components from designers um, and they're talking about, you know, pattern libraries and things like that, the, the next problem that you've got is trying to establish, you know, a common language, of course, but let's also talk about what the business case is for this. So what the, how, how this can actually address inefficiencies. So it might help you with subcontractors. So if you're a large organization um, and you've got a particular brand and then the problem is that you've got multiple vendors trying to implement that brand, how do you get them to communicate? How do you get them to work together? And so, of course, pattern libraries are a way of doing that because you can just hand those things out and go, here's how a button looks, here are, here's a font, here's how all of these components look. Uh, and it may be also that if you don't want to get involved in the implementation of something, then a pattern library can actually be part of your deliverable. So by this I mean, like, let's name it like a CMS that everyone hates. Can I get any contenders? Sorry? Joomla, okay, I was going to say like .NET Nuke or something really horrible, yeah. Um, but even things like, um, you know, uh, anyone who's tried to implement stuff on Salesforce, you know, that has real problems. I don't know if anyone's gone that far. Um, it, it's, it's pretty hard going. Um, it can be something where instead what you do is you deliver the pattern library, right, and then you can leave the implementation details to someone else who gets into the more of the, the server-side templating and then whatever the back-end uh, engineering of that is, right? So by having pattern libraries, you can actually also go into uh, responding to RFPs and things like that, where you wouldn't normally be able to do that because you, they might, might want someone who is like a Salesforce expert, but you can pair with the Salesforce thing, establish a contract that says the deliverables will be a pattern library and then also provide that to them. And there are ways of sort of allow using pattern libraries as an abstraction layer to allow you to work better with other companies. So, let's just look at some of the considerations. So, this is a project um, that we've been working on. So, the New Zealand On Air website, um, done in, we've used Sketch and Zeppelin.io. So, that's the thing where you upload your uh, Sketch files and then the designer can also mark them up. So, add extra detail to those and describe portions of it. And then that's just a way of communicating. But what the um, new version of Zeppelin also lets you do is to have actual components, right? So not just screenshots. And then when they click through on, say, this button, I asked a designer to do this screenshot for me, and this is all they did for me. They just put some lines on it. So you've got this button here, and then you actually get to see when we're in the design, this button is used. So you've got this unambiguous way of expressing, of communicating from designer to front-end developer what the component is, where it's used, whether or not it's reused, or whether or not it's a one-off, and also you've got names for things, you've got IDs. And so if you establish a naming convention up front, or negotiate one, then it means that you can have a common language. So there's none of this thing where the front-end developers have to just decide, oh, this is, I'm going to call this a card, I'm going to call this an alert box, but really you want to usually be using the business language for these kinds of things if you want it to be a scalable naming convention. So. The more common uh, thing when people think about pattern libraries, though, is more around front-end developer communicating to front-end developers, and that goes back to the bootstrap example, right? So uh, these are these types of things where you might have various buttons, you'll explain various states of them, and then later on down the page, you'll have uh, code examples of all these things. This is from the United States government pattern library. Um, New Zealand government are also looking at a pattern library right now. Uh, Australians also have one, British government have one, um, and 
yeah, there's, there's lots of sort of considerations we'll get into. On the next slide, though, um, I've got an example, and I hope the sound works on this one, of um, BBC's uh, pattern library called Gel. So just a little intermission video. What is gel? Gel is like clothes. Who is following stuff in a standard stand? These standards, or patterns, provide a recognisable foundation we can all understand. Clothes help us express our style. Whether it's unobtrusive, outlandish, or, or somewhere, somewhere in between. between. <laughs> New designs are usually based on similar patterns. These patterns say a lot about the wearer. Patterns are efficient because they can be reused time and again, but this doesn't limit expression. They can be tweaked and embellished to suit new and different purposes. And even something as simple as changing the colour can make the same pattern look very different. Like clothes, the look and feel of the BBC is based on established standards. They help designers express certain characteristics. Anything from the colours we use to the way things move and behave. It's all gel. Gel is our shared framework. On which creative expression can thrive at the BBC and beyond. <laughs> Close. No. We're going to have a dance off after this, so you can all join them. <coughs> Continuing. Okay, so let's start with something simple, right? Imagine we're going to actually design our first pattern library. We're going to design our first component. So something simple like a search box. So what do we need to just do anything like this, right? Like first of all, we'd, we're going to be doing CSS, so we're going to need, I suppose, like a CSS normalizer or a um, reset. Probably a normalizer that's better, right? Um, and we're probably going to have, you know, element styling. We're going to have some kind of HTML examples for this. And you know, there's lots of questions around this. There's sort of CSS engineering, HTML engineering, how to make something accessible. And there, that's not really what I'm going to be talking about in the following bit, um, because those aren't really pattern library specific questions, right? Like normalizing and stuff, that's just what you have to do when you're doing web dev. So um, let's just go on. So when you've got components like this, and you start thinking about this, when you've got a few more components, you know, what, what are the general ideas here, right? Like what is the color scheme? How do you express things like themes? Do you have to consider name spacing? So I don't know if you noticed, but in the USA government pattern library approach, everything was prefixed with a USA. And then you keep saying USA again and again and again, like they're chanting at you. <coughs> it's really creepy. Um, so there's also, you know, aspects like modularity, right? So if we, yeah, what, what, what just, just simple thing, you know, what, how do you organize this stuff on a, on a file system or, or like navigation, these types of things, you know? Um, are you going to do something like, say, Bootstrap, where you've got a single sort of root CSS file and then you sort of optionally choose to import things down the, f down the page? Or do you want to sort of go more of a, uh, a more modular approach where uh, the HTML is somehow referring to CSS and you can build all of these things independently? Um, so you might be getting into things like uh, CSS modules or, you know, CSS and JavaScript approaches or, you know, there's all these various technologies around that, right? Um, so just a question here, um, how many of you have made websites for government? Could I get just raise of hands? I've done it. It's not, it's not, it's not shameful. You can, you can, you can, <laughs> you can, you can, you can put your hand up if you've made it. Okay. So, um, so obviously there are things there with government and accessibility. So how many people, if we could just keep the hands up, how many people, um, have assured that what they've made is accessible? Okay, good, interesting. Um, so let's just have a look at an, uh, something that... Uh, yeah, no, it has to be every time. I'm just gonna try, no, not that one. Okay, oh, 
Dang it. Okay. I'm just going to try and make the best feature. Okay, so here's a thing that the uh, British government did um, for accessibility for people who override their colors on the page. So you can configure your browsing. You know, one of the original ideas of CSS, right, was that there might be a user style sheet. Uh, they might provide their own colors. How do you do that? So they, they actually went through and found out all this stuff where peop people actually try and do this, right? They want to be able to do this to, to websites. Government have a monopoly on services. They have like a, I'd say, moral obligation to provide for everyone, right? You can't, you can't go shopping elsewhere. And users change colors. They need to be able to do this for accessibility reasons. And how many of the people have made government websites are convinced that they have actually allowed for this kind of feature in their accessibility considerations? And I'm kind of guessing there aren't many. So even when we're talking about something really simple, like a text box, and everyone thinks, you know, oh, I can make that, I can make that accessible, that's not a problem. There are so many difficulties in that. And so really, it's, it's coming at it from sort of a computer science standpoint, where when you have complexity in something, you need to make it modular, and you need to make the problem a lot simpler, sort of reduce it down to its, to its simplest thing. And so components, in terms of user interface and pattern libraries, are a really good way of being able to polish something and work on it and actually make it excellent. And, sorry. That's the gist of that, that one. So I'd say that pattern libraries actually allow you to improve the quality of what you're doing because it's more abstract and it doesn't have so many other considerations. Uh, of course, there's you know, issues like namespacing, like I mentioned before, the USA thing. But if you're going to do something like, say, CSS modules, and that's gonna, they might just handle namespacing for you, right? Because it just on the fly generates class names that have a particular random prefix, and who cares, right? That's just something the compiler does, so. Um, theming, this was, I, I, I don't know who took this photo. I saw it on Twitter, and I, I forgot to note who took it. I'm not trying to steal someone's photo on Twitter. Um, but this was, you know, theming, right? So how do you do that? If you've got a particular default look for something, but then you want to do theming, does that mean that you're going to have like a, a theme class in the body, and then that's just going to in, in a sort of CSS selector sense, override particular colors down the hierarchy in the cascade. So there's, you know, these types of things you need to consider, especially if you're uh, making a pattern library for all of government, because each agency is gonna have its own color scheme, right? To a certain degree, its own fonts. So you need to be able to pull out the right kinds of things, figure out what's essential in your component and what's not. Um, um, and now just to talk specifically about some examples. Uh, so there's systems like, you know, Storybook is probably one of my favorites. Uh, Storybook's more for React components. However, it also helps you document, uh, yeah, the CSS and HTML and sort of things like that that are behind your actual components. This one can get into how you, how you, uh, how you interact with it and also various states, because a lot of pattern libraries are more around components that don't actually change through their life cycle on the page, whereas this one's quite good at documenting and explaining how things uh, mutate through their life. Um, there are other ones like, like ones like Westpac Gel, so Westpac Australia, um, but they've gone into all of this kind of stuff. They've got, so this is because Westpac, you know, massive of course, um, and they have a lot of vendors, so they're using a pattern library in order to try and achieve consensus amongst, in terms of the, the look and the harmonization of styles across all of them. And they've also got things that allow you to build, uh, so you can sort of go through and go through and sort of add things to your cart, essentially, and then they'll just build you a little bundle that is to do with just patterns for that particular system alone. And a lot of these ones you'll see are, are sorry, if I just go back to Storybook. I should have just iframed all of this content in. If we see more examples, So 
So a lot of these systems actually look the same. So if you need to be able to control the look of the pattern library that you're making, you know, your government agency or whatever, um, then you need to be able, then this thing here, its storybook is actually quite hard to configure. Whereas the other ones, uh, there are other sort of build systems that provide quite a lot more customization. Uh, what have we got? And then we've got, you know, really simple ones as well, like this one, which is essentially just a, some static HTML that happens to look like what you might think a pattern library looks like, and then the idea is you just go in and modify it. So they're just giving you, you know, a default look, right? It's just a bunch of static HTML that you can tweak. Might have a build system behind it, but the output is static. So there's that kind of thing as well. So obviously when you're going around choosing a pattern library, if you believe it's useful for you, then those are the kind of things you'll need to figure out, how much you actually need to be able to customize it and present it to users. So one of the main problems with pattern libraries is the divergence of styles. So often what happens is that a pattern library can get unmaintained or diverge from the production site's CSS. And so how do you actually have a build system that allows you to unify the CSS and HTML from example use in the pattern library to the production use, right? Um, so there's this thing that I've been working on for a while uh, it's open source, so I guess it's okay to push it, right? Um, yep, yeah, good. And it's a pattern library designed to be easy to maintain. And those, those bits never lie, they're always true. So this is React Patterns. And what this does is it actually introspects the CSS on the page and builds the previews automatically. So what I mean by that, if I just go through there's a demo somewhere down here, is there? I believe there is. Yes, there's a client of ours called... <laughs> Long night. Okay, LAC. Okay, so here's an example of something, and as you can imagine, you know, there's various headings. There's a HTML, part, uh, HTML uh, preview there about what it looks like. You can see that it's pulled out, you know, the class. And there are these CSS examples of all of the CSS that you need to use to be able to build that there. And what's a bit unique about this system is that it's actually doing this on the fly. So it's part, it's getting this HTML and it's uh, pretty printing it um, uh, in, the, in the browser. But the CSS is actually also just derived from an introspecting in the browser. So the browser has these APIs and you can actually ask for a particular element what CSS rules there are that match this element. And so because of this, this page is actually using the production site's compiled CSS and is able to derive all of this automatically. So, you know, because it's trying to solve the problem, of course, of how do you uh, keep, how do you solve the maintenance problem, right? Because you don't want to have that maintenance burden with a, with a pattern library. If it gets in the way, then it's going to be not something you're going to actually appreciate using. So that's the, you know, one approach to solving the divergence problem. Another one is to uh, publish components on, say, NPM or something, you know, a private repo on an NPM or something like that. So in summary, um, I'd say that the mo some of the most important benefits of pattern libraries are that you get to standardize the language. And I know that might sound like a real simple thing, but being able to refer to the same types of things across everyone across the whole team, not just the, within the developers, is really useful. Um, it means, and also what you should be trying to do is to get designers to give you patterns. They shouldn't be handing screenshots of pages anymore. They need to do a bit better job. They're on notice. <laughs> um, and if you're gonna make a product, if you're gonna make a pattern library, then you really do need to consider it a product, like you do need to maintain it over time. So you need to think about, it's not something you just build once and throw over the fence, right? Like it needs to be something that, that is in your development life cycle. That anytime you build something new, it's because you're building a component on your website. And then that bit gets published to the pattern library and then also the production website. Um, and then it might need to, depending on the complexity of your organization, you might need to get into the design system and the governance and all of those ways that you approve things, of course. Who knows if this is a problem that you actually have, but it's a problem that I have. So that too, all of that stuff.
minimize maintenance, that will be a real problem if you don't solve that upfront. Final thoughts? I, I already did that. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, that's done. The end. Okay. There's, um, there is a, a, a little bit here, a hidden track. So I could like stand here for half an hour in silence, like a, like a traditional hidden track would be, you know, and then I could reveal the next bit or I could just hit next right now. So th I'm just a big fan of this stuff. Browser engine, quantum servo, completely unrelated to pattern libraries. It's a new thing that's going to be, you remember how Chrome leapfrogged uh, Firefox back in 2007? Firefox is about to do the same to Chrome. WebRender is an amazing bit of technology. Anyone who's been getting into this stuff, is, it's just beautiful. They're able to do, I'll just rent, do that again just so you can appreciate it. Chrome, 15 frames. <laughs> and, and that's 60 frames a second because it's locked in the browser. It can go 200, 300 frames a second easy on, on hardware that's like a decade old. It's really good. Um, and there's all kinds of other stuff like multi-threaded layout, like multi-threaded CSS parsing, multi-threaded DOM layout. It's just amazing tech that Servo is, who, which is a Firefox project, is bringing slowly piece by piece back into Firefox. Um, by the end of the year, um, Firefox is going to be so far ahead in terms of like animation and stuff. The ad one of the advantages of WebRenderer is that it lets you animate all CSS properties pretty much, not just opacity and transform, right, which are the traditional ones you use for hardware acceleration. This lets you do almost everything. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially they've moved the CSS rendering to the GPU. So um, they've got font rendering, like text rendering with this thing called Pathfinder, and it's just amazing tech. Well, like I said, it's like 10 years old. I mean, on, on iPad, you know, that's a walled garden, right? They don't let you install third-party browsers, so they won't have it. But, but Android would. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Cheers. <laughs>